Father, as we turn our attention to your word, we thank you that your word changes our lives, Lord, that your word is alive and powerful. And we open our hearts wide for you to speak into our hearts, Lord, your words of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I would like to continue along the lines of our theme that we've had for this past term, although we're into the holidays now, but it's still turning in my heart. We've been speaking about heart momentum, and that we are moved by God's love, that that's the primary thing for which we are to live and by which we live in this life. Now, I've entitled this morning's message, Love Unlimited, Love Unlimited. I want to start my message off by saying to you and underlining again how much the love of God is needed in this world. Certainly I know it, and I believe you know it, but even out there in the world, people won't be able to maybe define it exactly, but deep within the heart of every human being, there is a need to know the love of God. Not the love of just someone, but the love of God. And folks, to truly know Jesus is the only way by which you can both experience and express that love. So I want you to hear these two words. I'm going to be playing on them. We need to, in, to enable us to, to know God's love, we need to know Jesus. To experience His love and to express His love is what it's all about. We are calling over the past few weeks, you and all Christians that would bother to listen, to live a life of love. And I found in Ephesians chapter 3 a wonderful trail left by the Apostle Paul as he describes how we can follow to live a life of love. I want to read quite a few verses this morning from Ephesians chapter 3, starting with verse 14, and they will appear on the screens. And I ask you to read them with me. I'm reading from the New King James Version. That's what those couple of letters after the Scripture means. NKJV, uh, New King James Version. So please follow, and I will be referring back to these scriptures as I go through the message. Verse 14 starts out, and it says the following. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ. Please note this, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. <clears throat> Pardon me. All that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. You will note some red letters. They're there for a purpose. Verse 21. To Him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. One of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. But this journey of Paul in prayer for people to live in God's love, starts in verses I have not read, but I want to refer to. My first point is, there's a huge encouragement need in our world. In the verse, verses preceding this, 
Paul talks about the wonderful freedom and confidence we have through Christ now coming to the Father. But he goes on to say also that he is suffering as he writes that letter. Paul suffered quite a lot. He was beaten up, stoned, ridiculed, chased around, imprisoned, and finally died. He had a hard time, actually. It was not all fun and games. But Paul is writing to the Ephesian Christians, and he's saying, hardship in life and the trials and suffering I'm going through, I don't want it to discourage you. And he touches through that on one of the greatest issues we face. It's to remain positive and encouraged in life. And he says in verse 14, for this reason, I'm bowing my knee to pray for you. So Paul is actually saying to all of us through his writings today, I know that one of your greatest challenges is to remain encouraged and full of faith and positive in this life. And he says, I'm going to pray for you that that will happen. Folks, I have found that experience with God's love brings positive expectation. And people look for positive expectation everywhere. It's sometimes amazing for me if I would pop into a shop on certain critical days, like I don't know when, when those days are, like Fridays or uh, Friday nights or whenever they, it comes up. I'm, I'm not allowed to use the words, but you'll figure it out shortly. And I see people in shops standing, and they've got little long cards like this, and they're going like... Yeah, they, they're doing that thing. Because they're looking anywhere for a little bit of luck, something to come through that will encourage them. Not thousands, millions. It's just a sign of people that are so desperate just for, for a little bit of good news in a few days' time. It's just one of the signs. The fact is that there's a great need for encouragement in this world, and Paul knew it, and he saw it. And he didn't want Christians to be without courage, but he also knew that the only place where they can authentically find it is not by or whatever else you use, but it's by being in the love of God and knowing Christ. And so that's what he prays for them. But I want to say to you, we know this life around us shows us a lot of hardship, injustice, failure, disappointment on a daily basis. You don't have to go far to see needs and discouragement around us and even for ourselves to get discouraged. Sometimes all you have to do is turn on the news and you go, oh no. And Paul recognized this and he's giving us a life-giving message and a prayer. And he knew where to find the solution for courage and encouragement in this life so that our lives can count for the positive and that we can become a force for encouragement in this life and a force for hope and not join the great band of discouraged people and hopeless and cynical people around us. And so Paul starts with prayer. He starts with prayer. But not only prayer. Prayer and humility. And he starts off like this. He says, for this reason, I bow my knee before our Father. And he prays with humility. And I would like to ask you this morning that you will write, live into this message with me. And that as you face everyday life and hardship and tough times and sometimes discouragement and the quest for courage and that you will remember it starts here on bended knee as that man is kneeling and praying. That's where it starts. And it calls for humility. Please just don't miss this very important place. Paul doesn't say just, I'm just praying. He says, I bow my knee. And it shows to us and gives us a key 
to the place where we have real contact with God is where you humble your spirit in prayer before Him. May I ask you that we check our prayers, that we do not engage in demanding arrogant prayers. There's some people that think sometimes because they've learned a few scriptures and a a few tricks spiritually, they can begin to tell God what to do. I just, I don't like that kind of thing, to be honest. And I've got no issues in my life about confessing the Bible, but I I just want to say to you, um, when you come before God, never come with arrogance. Come with humility. And it's right that you quote the Word of God and that you you, you, you pray Scripture, but never in a way where we demand from God, I'm, I've confessed this six times now, and so do it. Uh, it's not real. I believe this is the kind of prayer that opens the heavens. A prayer from bended knee, humility. And I, I would like to ask you this morning, even if you maybe can't kneel, but that we as a church family in every life here, if you feel you can do it with conviction and you can do it physically, I want to pray a prayer that's only got, let me check my notes, one, two, three, four, five, about eight words, and that we pray it with great humility from this church today. I'll tell you what the prayer is before we pray it so that you can be with me. Just to pray this in humility, and I'm going to go on bended knee. If you want to join, you're welcome. But to say, Lord, I am a servant of your love. Just those words. That we as a church begin to pray to offer ourselves as servants of His love in this world. That we humble ourselves. We don't bring firstly all our needs and complaints and cries, but that we come offering ourselves on bended knee to the Lord. I I feel this is one of those sermons actually I can comfortably preach from my knees. Because it's in a great humility that you go into this. But join me if you, in your heart, want to offer yourself to become a servant of God's love in this world. This is a very holy moment. I believe that the whole of heaven is looking down with the Father from His throne room upon this church, upon every life, as we're getting ready to pray. I ask you to pray this simple prayer. You can add your own words but let it come to something like the following. Lord, I am a servant of your love. I offer my life in service of your love. Lord, to show people in this world that are so desperate for hope and encouragement, your love. And now, Lord, strengthen us with might by your Holy Spirit in our inner man and fill us with your love again and again and again. That we will be those who see exceedingly abundantly above things happen through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your humble prayers with me.
What you have just prayed is what Paul, in essence, prays. Paul prays, my third point to you this morning, for inner preparation. Inner preparation. And in verse 14, Paul prays for an inner, uh, sorry, verse 16 rather, he prays for an inner encounter with the Holy Spirit that will prepare the heart of every person for the ultimate revelation to be received. Let, let me read it for you. He says, I'm praying for you that He will grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. And I want you to understand Paul's prayer. And maybe using a very simple example, I use the example of a bird's nest. A bird's nest. It is as if Paul's prayer is like a bird that builds a nest. And he says, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will come and prepare your heart for something very important. You know, when a nest is built, it is in anticipation for something to come. Is that right? And Paul is saying, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will come and fashion your heart as a nest for something very precious to come. And that precious thing is the greatest revelation ever. It's my next point. And we read in verse 17 what it is. The greatest revelation is this. Verse 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not get confused. Check this. He's writing to Christians. But he prays that they may really know that Christ dwells in their hearts through faith. And so allow me to pause this morning and say this, Paul is busy explaining and praying for people to live a life of love. But where he starts is he says, Holy Spirit, prepare the nest for the greatest revelation. The greatest revelation is Christ has come to live in your heart by faith. And I stop there and I pause there to say to you, I find that many, many, many times you meet Christian people, people who come to church, people who say they believe in Jesus, but have never experienced that He actually comes to live inside of you. He doesn't come for a holiday. He doesn't come to just visit like your in-laws. Thank God they come and they go. <laughs> but He comes to stay. He comes to stay, to live, to habitate with you. And that is a different Christian experience from just saying, yeah, I go to church and yeah, somewhere I ask Jesus for my life. But to know that the miracle of miracles is He's come to live in your heart. That's what Paul is praying for. Because if He comes to live and stay with you, He comes with something. And we're going to get into that in a moment. So Christ has come to live in your heart. And remember just that all that's needed for that is simple faith. Salvation faith. Faith that says, I, I put my whole trust in Him to be my Savior in my Lord. It's amazing that he writes that to Christians, showing still that it's a common problem, that many Christians don't live with this precious revelation. Christ in you is our hope for glory. Now back to my nest. And so a nest is built in anticipation of receiving this precious egg, this revelation. And the nest of your heart is prepared by the Holy Spirit, even this morning, in anticipation for receiving the treasure, the promise of life in Christ. That's the purpose. Folks, the Holy Spirit doesn't come past just to give us some goosebumps and a great feeling and a wonderful experience. No, He always works towards bringing Christ alive in you. And I'm so glad He's busy doing that this morning 
in our midst. So Paul's journey of prayer for a life of love starts with this. Oh, Holy Spirit, prepare hearts for this revelation. And then bring that revelation, Christ, in you. And then comes the love story. And in the next verses that we will go to, we find what Christ wants to do in you. Now that He's in your heart, what does He want to do in you? Verse 20 spells it out. It says, to know the love of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Sorry, I'm, I'm in the wrong verse. Verse 17. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. So first thing that Christ comes to do now that He lives in your heart is not to give you a nice time just or this or that, but it's to root and ground you in His love. To use more modern words, He comes to cement and secure and stabilize you in His love. That's what He comes to do. It goes on in the next verses, verse 18 and 19, and it says that you may be able to comprehend or understand. So he comes to let you grow in understanding of his love. It's not a one-time thing. It's like being in the school of love. Jesus comes in and being inside of you, he begins to teach you so that you can understand his love. I want you to note something in verse 18. It says that you may be able to comprehend or understand with all the saints, what is the width and length and breadth and height of His love? Let me just make a statement here. That's why church is important. I'm going to make quite a statement. Are you ready for this? That's for the people who's got problems with church always because, you know, they met another skellum sitting over there and another, yeah, that's a bad. Church is not the gathering of the perfect. You know my favorite line, it's the gathering of the forgiven. So stop looking and say, well, uh, yeah, that person is supposed to be a Christian and they cut in front of me and took my parking. I know. But you've also done it. So stop acting so holy. So just because people get fed up with the church and they blame the whole church and then they sit at home angry and they just watch TV because I want to be with those people. They just dress up on Sundays. I know all those stories. But check your heart now this morning. Here's the truth. Paul says, I want you to understand fully the love of God. But he puts a qualification to it. He says, with all the saints. Because you see, there's some dimension of God's love that you can only experience when you're in, not outside. And actually, that's our privilege too is God knows that as others are beginning to experience His love, we shine it out. Sometimes the love of God really comes to you from a, a person right next to you. That just in your moment of sadness or grief, puts an arm around you and pray a prayer. And you can feel the love of God through them. I'm saying simply this to you. Paul says, the fullness of the experience of the love of Christ can only come when you're in the body not outside. You can't get this by mail. You can't get this all on your own there in your little bed. The fullness of this is to be experienced in this dynamic of God's people. Puts a great responsibility on us too, that we will not hold back the love of God from each other. When you come in church here, it doesn't matter what you've experienced on the road here, fighting with your wife or the children or your husband or whatever, but when you're in here, you're on a love mission. Put the smile on and love people here. This is love zone. Not love boat, love zone. And people come here with a great need to experience love. Today you give, tomorrow you receive. Amen. That's what defines us. And we are not perfect. We're different. But we all have the love of God in this place available. And when we gather like this, I don't know about you, but I feel loved. Really. And I hope you feel loved. And if you don't feel loved, just nudge that person slightly and say, Hey, crank up the love there. Hey, you, love me. No, don't do that. <laughs> the thing that impacts people who walk into a church the most it's not the singing, 
and the nice pictures and the stuff, and the music, but what catches them is whether there's real love. And may it be that we will remain in this church so full of the love of God, ir irrespective of our shortcomings and failures and some people's faces are like this and that. It doesn't matter, but that what people will catch when they walk in here, what you will catch is that the love of God is in this place. Amen. So Paul says, I, I want you to be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and depth and height and what, everything about the love of Christ. He says, I want you to grow in understanding this love. And then he goes to verse 19 and he says, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So Paul is encouraging, and in his prayer, he's drawing us into a place to say, listen, what Christ wants to do in you is not just let you be rooted and grounded in love and understand it rationally, but go beyond knowledge to experience this love. You know, you can tell me all about ice cream, but man, what I really want is to experience it. I've often told the story, but I just feel I need to tell you again. I'll never forget my eldest son. He was still in diapers or nappies, whatever you want to call it. And he was still in those little chairs we have in the car. And I remember going from church. He was just a little toddler. And we stopped at an ice cream shop on the way home. And he'd never tasted ice cream in his life. Never. And I took his little dummy, you know, the... I got a nice chocolate ice cream, the healthy kind, you know, <laughs> pure chocolate. And I dunked his dummy in the ice cream, and I put it in his mouth. And his first reaction was shock. Like, because it's cold and he didn't expect it. Never tasted ice cream in his life before. The next minute, it was as if he had encountered an angel. <laughs> his, his face lit up. It's like, whoa, what is this, Daddy? And he took his dummy out, gave it back again, said, do it again. Like, it's the same with God's love. You know, till this day, I can never forget that little face. The shock and then the delight and then more. I want. You know, I want to say to you, please, we need to know and understand the love of God here, that He really loves you, and we've preached through that. But ultimately, it's got to be experienced. Lick the ice cream. And that's what Paul is praying for. He says that it will surpass knowledge, that your experience with God's love will become real to you. Not stopping with knowledge. Yeah, I know God loves me. But then you know they haven't experienced it for quite a while when they've got that tone of voice. And it comes to an amazing place in that scripture. It says this at the end of verse 19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Congregation, serious word here. It's good to laugh together, but don't miss this. You can chase fulfillment through many things, through hard work, through creativity, through success, through money, through a perfect little family, but real fulfillment does not come through those things. They can come and they can go, but real fulfillment is the product of living in the fullness of knowing and experiencing God's love. Yeah, that's fulfillment. And the greatest thing is that even if other things in your life may be falling apart or maybe not in shape or you may have had great losses, but you can still be fulfilled if you live in the love of Christ and if He lives in your heart. Where I want to end with this message is that finally, if you live in this place, it lifts you and it lifts your life to a higher dimension. It's my next point. Life on a higher dimension. This is a place where I call a place of unlimited love experience and expression. Man, it's the place to go for. The fullness of God's love positions you. Everything in life is about position, that you're positioned correctly. And the fullness of His love that we've just read about that Paul is praying for positions you in this place for expression of God's love and power on a whole new dimension. That's why you were made. 
Yes, you may be a teacher or a lawyer or a salesperson or a mommy or a daddy or whatever, but ultimately you were made to express God's love to this world from what you are experiencing for real in your own heart. I want you to note as we go to verse 20, Paul writes this, he says, Now to him who is able, and then comes that description of the higher dimension. He says, to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. It's like Paul can't reach high enough to describe this high dimension. He says, God is able to do that. And now listen to this. Above what we can ask or think, here, here it comes, according to the power that works in us. I find many Christians still live with the ultimate expectation from outside. They come into a meeting and they say, oh, we're just waiting for the presence of God to come in. I thought you brought it in. <laughs> if more Christians will live fully aware that they are carriers, that it's in you where that love is, where the presence of Christ is, then you will bring that sense of God wherever you go. And I pray that my life won't be more like that. I hope you too. But let's begin to shift that we always... We're always wait, wait, waiting for an alien invasion. No, you bring it. And that's exactly, this is scriptural, what I'm preaching to you. Paul says, I'm praying for you, that you will know this God who is able to lift your high, life to a higher dimension, exceedingly abundantly above all that you can think or ask, according to the power that works within you. I present to you that that power that works within you is the power of Christ's presence in you and His love in its fullness. Yeah, this is a fantastic place. Folks, from this place, we become those who shine. From this place, the exceedingly abundantly above dimension begins to work in you that when the rest of the people are down, you're up. When everybody else is caught in sadness, you have gladness. It's not because you're superhuman, but it's because you've got Christ in you and His love, and it lifts you to another level of exceedingly, abundantly above living. Begins to work in you. Remember, He says it works in you, but ultimately, it needs to work through you like that lighthouse picture so beautifully illustrates, and shines outward, outward. And the place where all of this must end, my last point, is it is to the glory of God. The chief end of man is that we will live to the glory of God. question is always how. Is it when we go around and say to people, oh, God is good, God's great. Or does it happen when we live on this higher dimension from the power of the presence of Christ in me that I show this love to this world? I believe it's the latter. Now the focus comes in the last verse. And the focus is what does God want to do through you and me? Only now that we've been positioned, Holy Spirit, prepare the hearts. Prepare. Oh, put that egg of that preciousness of Christ in you. Yes, and now rooted and grounded in love, full of love, full of love, experiencing that love. And, and now, whoo, a new level, a new level up here. Whoa, exceedingly abundantly above. I'm living up here. Now I can shine. I've never heard of a lighthouse underground. <laughs> now God says, hey, look what my love has done for you. It's lifted you. Now begin to shine for my glory. And understand when you act in my love, when you act from my presence, you live for my glory. God gets the glory when His church is filled with His love and power and expressing it. And He will use your love and Christ-filled life to bring eternal encouragement. It's beautiful. It says, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus, but to all generations forever and ever.
God will use and He wants to use your life to bring internal encouragement and hope to this world for His glory. Folks, living with Christ in you and in the fullness of God and His love brings forth a different kind of Christian. A Christian that is unashamed, unafraid, and courageous to show God's love without limits. May I ask you this morning, is Jesus really living in your heart? Are you rooted and grounded, secure, standing in His love? Do you know by experience the fullness of His love? I invite you from that place to step into a new dimension, to live a life exceedingly abundantly above even what you can think or ask. Before I can close this morning, I believe that there's people in this place whose hearts the Holy Spirit have prepared for that precious revelation to understand today it's not about belonging to a church or a group, but it's about inviting Christ to come and live inside my heart, in my life. And if you've never reached that place, then today is your day. The Bible says it's by faith. Now I want to offer a simple prayer for everyone who's not sure or who's never asked Jesus to come and live in your heart, in your life. That you can pray a simple prayer of faith. And God will answer. So I ask you to get ready in your heart and say, Franco, I, I'm not sure. And if that's the place where I need to start, I want to start there today and not miss it. Ask that we all close our eyes. Just a moment to pray this very important prayer. And now it's between you and God. Very serious business. You have to answer to Him. And He is asking have you accepted me and asked me to come and live inside of you and be your Lord? If you cannot say yes with certainty, then this is the prayer I offer for you to pray. Simple faith to ask him to come and live in your heart. Pray it sentence by sentence after me, quietly in your heart. God will hear and respond. Are you ready? Make your decision. Pray the prayer with me right now. It starts like this now. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God who died for me. I confess I've done wrong things, Lord. I've done my own thing, Lord. And I ask your forgiveness. And I receive your forgiveness, thankfully. And now, Jesus, I invite you to come and live in my heart forever. And I surrender my life to you. Be my Lord and fill me with your love. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Please keep your heads bowed just for a moment as People are transacting with God as the Holy Spirit is doing something in hearts. And I ask you to please, if you prayed that prayer, respond. Just step by step with me. I want this to be sealed forever in your life, that this is a turning point day. If you prayed that prayer with conviction, lift your hand and say, yes, I prayed that prayer today. I've asked Jesus to come and live in my heart. Lift your hand high, please, and keep it there. Can I ask you, as you lift your hand, follow it through and stand to your feet and take your first stand for God. This is not a life to be ashamed of. If you prayed that prayer, stand to your feet, wherever you are. Stand and say, Lord, this is me. I am committing my life in this day to you. Wherever you are, if you, if you prayed that prayer, stand to your feet, please. Stand to your feet in acknowledgement of that. 
Thank you, thank you. All over people are standing. Now please allow us to seal this finally with a prayer. So I'd like to ask you to bend down, pick up your Bible or your cell phone, and with whoever's with you can bring you down, make your way right down to the front here. Our pastoral team will meet you. We want to pray a personal prayer with each of you. Everyone. Folks will wait. Don't worry, you won't miss the lift. Push out from where you are standing. People will be okay with that. And bring your Bible or your handbag, whatever you've got. Don't leave it, because the guy next to you might not have given his life to Christ. Who knows what's going on here? But come down. We want to pray for you. Come, 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 come. And make it quick, please. This church service is not over. We are still going to corporately pray a final prayer, very important prayer. Just give these folks time to get you. So glad that you are responding. This is marvelous. Well done, well done, well done, well done. Come. To give your life to Christ is the wisest thing you can ever, ever do. Give a moment for people to come down from these stairs and from the back. Fantastic. Oh, we are so rejoicing with you. And heaven is rejoicing with you. This is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Come, please come, come, come. We have a pastor on duty that's uh, waving there. June, is it you? That will take you into our prayer room and pray with you and give you something to take home with you. Something to encourage you as you walk with Jesus. But we want to, as, as a family, say to you, we are proud of you and we pray God's blessing upon you. Can you give them a fantastic applause? Thank you, Father, for all of these folks that's taken this awesome step today. And there's more coming. That's fantastic. Wonderful. Let's pray for them. Father, we pray that you will so cover them with your love and Father, let they be truly rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, cemented, stable, standing forever. And that every day, Lord, they will have experience with your love. We bless them, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please turn to your left? They won't take you long. And follow our pastors as they lead you out there. Pastors, can you just help the people to follow there, just to follow through? And you'll be with your family back in a few moments' time after you've received our booklet and some personal prayer. Thank you. Follow, follow through there. I would like to ask the congregation remaining if we can end with a very significant prayer. It'll appear on the screens and I believe it's correct to ask that we stand to pray that prayer together. Read it through once with me before we pray it so that you can really get into it. It reads as follows. Dear Jesus, help me to spread your fragrance everywhere I go. Flood my soul with your spirit and love. Shine through me. Shine through me. That every soul I come in contact with may feel your presence in my soul. Let them look up and see no longer me, but only Jesus. Stay with me, and then I shall begin to shine as you shine, so to be a light to others. It's a prayer penned by Mother Teresa. Powerful prayer, and she lived it. Let's make that our prayer today. Are you ready? Can we pray open eyes? Watch and pray. You ready? Hear our prayers now, Lord, as we pray this. Dear Jesus, help me to spread your fragrance everywhere I go. Flood my soul with your spirit and love. Shine through me that every soul I come in contact with may feel your presence in my soul. Let them look up and see no longer me but only Jesus. Stay with me, and then I shall begin to shine as you shine, so to be a light to others. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord go with you, and shine with His love, and give hope and encouragement in this world. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.